I was saying that we are going to be um, looking at Queen's Park in chronological order, um, rather than uh, just looking at the attractions as we walk along. So the actual walk and the talk online are a bit different. Um, Right. We are going to look at Queen's Park area and here on the map I made an outline of what the area called Queen's Park and those of you who may not be quite local um, it could be a bit tricky because actually we have uh, two Queen's Park plus the Queen's Park station in the middle. The Queen's Park estate which was built in 18. 74 is at the bottom and then we have and that's in the borough of Kensington and Chelsea and the sorry the Westminster what did I say that the borough of Westminster and our Queen's Park is the park and the area surrounding it um, and they are in the borough of Brent and in the middle we have the Queen's Park station. So actually we have three Queen's Park parks for the price of one. And going back to the very beginning of our story, the whole area of London where we are now was part of Middlesex. And the name of Middlesex came from a knife used by the Saxons and they called it sex, or um, rather this um, flag and coat of arms of the historic county of Middlesex is what the Tudors thought a Saxon knife would look like, so they came up with it. And you can see it proudly being displayed on Harrow Road uh, in front of St. John's Church. And Middlesex was a huge area um, between Essex, Sussex and Wessex. And in Doomsday Book, it was divided into six hundreds, which were the administrative units. And our area um, here was in the hundred of Alcestone, and that spread between Finchley and Farren Barnet southwards to the city of London. So that was quite a large area. Um, the Charter of Edward the Confessor. Uh, gave the wood for the abbey for uh, of the Westminster and corns for its pigs. So that was a wooded area for many, many years. From about 900s, a lot of land in this area was owned by St. Paul's Cathedral. And I tell the story how it came to be owned by St. Paul's Cathedral in my Talk. I've got someone who needs to be muted, so can we please? Um, um, and I think you know, right, can we mute the microphones, please? That would be helpful. Thank you. So, St. Paul's Cathedral came to own the land from about 1900s and um, it was divided into prebendary estates and prebendary estates were the areas of land that belonged to the cathedral and the income from those lands was given to this uh, to a particular person who did something for St Paul's Cathedral and they were called the prebends and Queen's Park area was in the prebendary estate of Brondesbury in the 15th century, Henry Chichely, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, bought um, a large area of land and created his estates. And when he died, he left his Wilsden estates to All Souls College, Oxford. So that's how the land got to be um, owned by different authorities. This map from the Victorian times shows that Brondesbury, where Queen's Park now is the blue area, that was prebendary estates of St Paul's Cathedral, and the area of Queen's Park estate just south of that was um, in the possession of All Souls College, Oxford, and Kensal Rise and the local areas, they were quite mixed at the time. 
in the 18th century, up uh, from those early times and up to the 18th century, the area was pasture and woodlands divided between various small holdings of the, of the farms. And when they tried to grow crops on it, they didn't actually have that much success because it is um, heavy clay soil, but they did very well growing hay and pasture. And up to 1800s, for example, we can see that this is all farmland and nothing much is happening. At the top here is where Queen's Park would be later. And they had a couple of farms, Kilburn Lane Farm and the actual Kilburn Lane and Chamberlain Farm. And the only major thoroughfare is Harrow Road here. Then by 1810, we have the canal, uh, which, was, which came here in 1801. And see what happens in about 50 years, the area becomes quite well connected and crisscrossed by railway lines. We've got London Northwestern Railway, which is this one where Queen's Park Station came on eventually. Then we have the Great Western Railway down here, which came in 1838. And the last one was Hampstead Junction Rail Railway. That's the one here. By 1680, they already had the Kensal Green Cemetery. And on next to it, a bit to the south, was Kensal, um, the, West the Western Gas Company um, gas works producing gas for London and the surrounding areas. But our area of Queen's Park was still basically farms. So as the population of London was growing and there were quite a few social problems associated with it, there were a few philanthropists who thought that we really should improve the uh, facilities for uh, the working people. And unlike um, big, um, important, big famous people in this area, like Lord Shaftesbury, for example, who built um, big block, blocks of flats in central London, the artisan laborers and general dwellings company decided that it is a good idea to provide um, small homes like terraced houses, but individual homes, low-rise housing in open countryside along existing railway lines so that people could live in the countryside or close to it and commute to the city. And um, in 1867, the company was established by William Austin, who was a um, laborer who uh, became a contractor and he did quite well and he decided to set up this company. He was illiterate, he couldn't read or write, but he had people who uh, went into partnership with, with him. Eventually he didn't do very well because he was ousted from his own company. As he said in the 1870, I was too honest for them that because there were some dealings which were not quite above board, but they sorted themselves out and they built several estates like um, according to the description, low-rise low housing um, in and around London. And in 1874, they bought 176 acres from All Souls College, Oxford, and decided to build 2,000 small houses with gardens, public amenities, but no pubs because being of good character and adhering to temperance principles was one of the main criteria where by which you were allowed to get a house there. So they started in 1874 and by 1882 they were more or less finished. And that's exactly what they built, terraced houses. Um, and if you go around there now you can see that they have the ceramic uh, plaques with the monogram of the company's initials on it and it is still very much there. They named 
the streets at right angles to Harrow Road, um, 1st Avenue to 6th Avenue, and the streets parallel to Harrow Road had alphabetical names, mainly people associated with the company or with the building. Um, Alperton Road, they brought the bricks from Alperton using the canal, or Sir Douglas Galton, he was a military engineer interested in public works, so that's Galton Street here. The main shopping area was on the Harrow Road, and also on Harrow Road was a big hall, uh, Queen's Park Hall, which was a working men's institute, and it included shops, a coffee tavern, and um, did all sorts of facilities for the local people. Um, interestingly, because they didn't allow pubs in the estate, they actually built a pub on the opposite side of Harrow Road, which unfortunately is now closed. At a very interesting address of 666 Harrow Road, they had the library, and um, it is still there, and it is still Queen's Park Library. Um, there were a few churches, St. John the Evangelist was the first one, which was on the corner of um, Harrow Road and Kilburn Lane, and that was there from 1844. Um, there was a church called St. Jude's in Lansfield Street, and that was um, a big brown and red brick church, but that's the best picture we have of it, because it closed and was demolished in 1960-61. But a lot of people are very familiar with St. Jude's Church because it had a St. Jude's Hall built nearby. And in 1882, two local football teams merged together to form Queen's Park Rangers, um, which since then moved all over the place but retained, retained their name up to today. And it has a lot of fans, including my husband, who took these lovely pictures and very happily follow them. Um, one of its most famous players was the first black player to appear in the English Football League, and his name was Thomas Hubert Best, and he played for QPR in the 1950s. They had a school, which is currently also a school, one of the very few original school buildings operating as such, and it is now grade two listed. And um, they had quite a close-knit community, especially when uh, people came from Ireland to work on the buildings of the railways. Um, and um, the community stayed there very close-knit up to quite late, 1920s. Um, they started to having trouble with the neighboring areas. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, the estate went into the council hands and they had quite a few problems, but the council, um, Westminster Council, who owns it now, they're trying to do quite a lot um, to improve that. The whole, most of the area is in conservation area and they look after their houses really nicely, but they remained more or less the way they were when they were built. I was um, going through the history of Queen's Park Estate at quite a big um, fast pace because I, they are technically in the um, borough of Westminster and we're doing this for Brent. So I want to spend much more time on the history of the Brent side of Queen's Park, where we're going now. And um, when the Queen's Park estate was built, the area which became Queen's Park later was still very rural. It was the fields and there were farms and big houses along Kilburn High Road. And it is Kilburn that was an area which was more or less populated because this straight road here was the old Edgware Road which was there from the Roman times and in the 
later times it came to be known as Watling Street and our bit of Edgware Road, Watling Street, is called Kilburn High Road because it was a major thoroughfare from a very long time ago. All the houses, um, pubs, shops and all the life was happening here. And by 1879, Charles Dickens in his uh, sketches described Kilburn as a newly built district at the far end of the Edgware Road. So they had housing in Kilburn here and they had Kensal Green, uh, sorry, Queen's Park Estate further down. Um, here we have the map showing the railways again and the development of metropolitan London came with the building of the railways but the housing didn't come as much with the building of the railways as when the stations appeared and it is the appearance of the stations that normally led to the housing development of the area and here we have our Queen's Park station which opened on the 2nd of June in 1879 on the London and North Western Railway Station. I was going to point out that it is, I think, should be somewhere here. It was on the line from London to Birmingham. And a bit later on, uh, they built an underground railway in London, Baker Street and Waterloo Railway, which started at the beginning of the 20th century. And by 1915, the services on the Baker Law Line, as it came to be known, uh, were extended to Queen's Park. So basically it was carrying two lines as it does today. The Station, station is very much like it was. Oh, we've got someone unmuted. Can you please mute the micro microphone again? Thank you. Uh, the station itself looks quite like it was today. So that's a nice bit of history there. Although it looks a bit grab and boring, but it's still very useful. The reason it opened on the 2nd of June, 1879 is because this was at the height of the preparations for the Royal Society Agricultural Show, which took place um, at the end of June that year. And the Royal Agricultural Society of England was founded in 1838, and its purpose was to promote the ideas of science for the farming community. A lot of scientific developments were taking in all areas of life in early Victorian times. But people realized that farmers at the time were actually the least mobile part of the population because they wouldn't be traveling to big cities to learn about all these in inventions and progress. So it was decided that a society should be formed which would hold agricultural shows in different parts of the country um, and bring all the latest achievements to farmers all across England. And the first one was in 1839 and the society has been going on, it, it is still going on, it's now an independent charity based in Warwickshire, but their last um, show was in 2009 and that was shortly after the foot and mouth disease. Um, and that kind of put the end to that idea. So in 1879, they decided to bring the Royal Agricultural Society to Kilburn, as it was known at the time. And that was because it was quite rural. It had loads of available land and it had good transport connections because it was not too far from uh, Kilburn High Road, the Edgware Road which was a major thoroughfare. And also um, Salisbury Road was um, quite useful as well to bring things in. And then the station, the railway station opened in the beginning of the months when the Agricultural Society show opened so they could bring machinery and things and people by train. They got a huge plot of land um, 
100 acres, uh, created an entrance on Salisbury Road, and the show was opened on the 30th of June, 1879, by the Prince and Princess of Wales. And it had machinery, stock, everything was to be the biggest one in the history of the society up to date. Everything was good until it actually opened and it started to rain. And it rained for all the four, five days when the show was on. The streets, the showground turned into a quagmire. People were sinking, animals were sinking, and the attendance was nowhere near what the organizers were expecting. And this is the overview from Illustrated London News of the showground. You can see the sheds, and there's some statistics here, how big it is going to be. So it was absolutely enormous. But quite disappointing because of the weather. Surprise, surprise. There was, however, a royal box where they paraded the winning cattle and horses. And um, that must be the Prince and Princess of Wales. That's a lovely picture. So because of the wetter summer, they made a loss of 1,500 £1, pounds. And also they um, realized that maybe people from London were not that interested in um, the, royal, the agricultural show as people in the countryside. But on, the, on Saturday, um, uh, towards the end of the uh, show, Queen Victoria visited. And Queen Victoria, she was a brilliant diarist. She wrote a diary every day since she, was, um, she, since she was a young girl. And those diaries were put online and made available by um, the royal family. So everyone can go online and for free to see what Queen Victoria had to say for every day of her reign. And I'm going to read you what she said about her trip to Kilburn. Started off with Beatrice, Leopold and others by rail for Kilburn to see the great agricultural show. Bet Bertie and the council, including Lord Spencer to the Duke of Sutherland, received me there and preceded us. Got into an open carriage and drove through the town of tents, which we accomplished without showers. The ground was one sea of mud from the dreadful rains of the last days so that planks had to be put down in some parts to drive over. Drove to the ring, very like a race course, where endless stands and tents had been put up, a fine large one for Bertie and the royal family. But the slush was so dreadful, we could not go to it. The animals of all nations, cows, bulls, horses, etc., were led up and down in succession, decked with rib ribbons, but they could hardly keep their footing from the fearful deep mud. There were splendid horses of all kinds, magnificent French and English stallions, also mules and donkeys. It is such a pity the weather was so unfavorable, as it would have been a beautiful sight and brought in much money, instead of which, I fear, they have lost a great deal. We had several sharp showers, but nothing to last. The crowds were immense and very loyal and enthusiastic. Got back by one and then drove at once to the show farm where Lord Bridport met us and we went to see the tent prepared for the 60 foreigners connected with the show who were coming down to Windsor. So Queen Victoria had a busy day. When a few years later, the new park was opened and she was celebrating her golden jubilee, Queen Victoria gave her consent for the new park at Kilburn to be called Queen's Park. So that's how we came to have the name of our park. The Royal Agricultural Society came to Brent once again in 1903 to a site near Twyford Abbey, which later became Park Royal. And we have an article on it in the Wilson Local History Society Journal. 
um, they, that was not a success either. And after that, they decided that they should really be holding agricultural shows in the countryside further away from London. So we can see that there were lots of housing being built all around the Queen's Park area. And that was the case for everywhere in London. And they did start getting lots of problems um, because um, there was not much provision for poorer working class, especially in central London. There was a great poverty, people were dying, there was no adequate facilities. And with it, there was the moral degradation, drinking, the breakup of families, crime, and all that sort of thing. And a lot of philanthropists at the time started to say, to say that uh, one of the things that would be good to improve the living conditions and the moral conditions of the people would be to create parks. As early as 1833, the Select Committee on Public Works presented a report to Parliament how parks would improve the problems in, of urban living. And a few parks started to appear. The first one, a publicly funded civic park, uh, was in Merseyside, Birkenhead Park in 1847, and that was designed by Joseph Paxton. He, um, but that was the first publicly funded one. In London, the first park was Victoria Park in 1845, um, it was not publicly funded, but it was public in a way that people could go in for free and everyone could go in and out without any charge or any restrictions. Then they had Battersea Park, Finsbury Park, Southwark Park, and a lot of parks sprang up all over the place. And they were made to a quite similar pattern. They all had winding paths a lake or a water feature, a bandstand, and um, a lovely place for people to be in. And here, when people realized that the building up of the area is going to happen really fast towards the end of the century, especially after the, the train station was opened, in 1884, um, a group of progressively minded individuals formed Northwest London Park League. They appealed to the ecclesiastical commissioners to assure that this land would be reserved for a public space. So this was this huge hundred acres of land that the ecclesiastical commissioners, that's the church commissioners, St. Paul's Cathedral people, they wanted to sell it off to the developers because they realized they're going to make quite a lot of money. However, being the church people, they were not completely against the idea of doing something for the public good. So they agreed to offer a small part or a part of the land to the corporation of the City of London um, to create a public park um, and the housing next to it. And the reason they offered it to the Corporation of London, because it came together with a gravel pit wood in Highgate, and they wanted them to take over those places altogether. However, the Corporation of London agreed to gravel and pit wood, but not to Kilburn, because they thought it was too expensive to adapt for public use. Remembering all the mud that was there for the agricultural show, uh, they probably thought that to drain it would be quite an undertaking. Uh, the Northwest London Park League persisted, and at some point they organized a meeting of 800 to 900 people, so they kept on on their course. And eventually the corporation agreed and they found the money to set up the park and to maintain it from the bequest of a gentleman called William Ward. And he was a businessman and philanthropist who worked in the city of London. Um, he was a dealer in bricks and building materials. He made quite a lot of money. He did not have any children. And he created a huge fund for the uh, City of London for various good courses. 
and one of those was to set up St. Paul's Girls School, which has a website with lots of excellent information about the history of this man. And the residual, whatever was left after the founding of St. Paul's School, corporation decided to use to set up the park. So they put some more money towards it and agreed to set up a park. They formally acquired the um, Kilburn and Highgate spaces. And on the 5th of November in 1886, the park was officially opened. And that's the um, plan of it from the original drawings. A lot of pictures coming up now will come from a document called A History of Queen's Park by Land Use Consultants 2011 and that's available online and that's like the best and most amazing source for information about the early history of Queen's Park. Going back a little bit, Queen's Park was named after Queen's, Queen Victoria and it was not the first park in her honor, named in her honor. There was a Royal Victoria Park, which opened in 1830. And by then she was 11 years old Princess Victoria. She, was hap she happened to be traveling through Bath with her mum, and the local dignitaries decided to open the public park and invited her to open it, which she did, called it Victoria Park. And the first park in London was called Victoria Park in Tower Hamlets, and that was in 1845. So there are a few parks named after the famous Queen Victoria as well. So back to the church commissioners. Um, they uh, granted the land uh, for the park and the they created two roads, Chevening and Mortimer Road, by either side of the park to, as approaches to it. And most of the streets around there are, uh, have the names associated with people from St. Paul's Cathedral, from the church commissioners. For example, Chevening was an estate owned by the Earl of Stanhope, chairman of the ecclesiastical commissions at the time. The task of laying out the park went to Alexander Mackenzie, who was a landscape designer to the Metropolitan Board of Works. And um, he came from Scotland, came down to London, um, became a quite famous landscape designer specializing in parks. He designed Alexander Palace Park, Finsbury Park, Southwark and some others. And he was superintendent of all the open spaces in charge of the Metropolitan Board of Works, including Hampstead Heath and Blackheath. So he was obviously the man to design the park. He was also an author. He wrote this pamphlet, pamphlet here about his views on garden design. And his influences and the influences of the parks were, um, came from France, where a few parks have been built in before. And by then, the English landscape gardening style was becoming more popular for parks than the previous strict um, parterres and geometric designs. And um, some people said that the way they had this sort of wavy paths and uh, the way they sort of intersected reminded people of the railway lines. Of course, that was the middle of the railway boom as well. That was because the guy who did it in 1868 in France, Alfond, Alfond, Alfons, Alfond, he originally was a railway engineer. But you can see how this design is similar to the box designed by Alexander Mackenzie in London. That's all his designs. They all have paths, circular sports areas, a water feature. And this is what he, he created for Queen's Park as well. And you can see on the boards outside the park that um, the park is now almost exactly the same as it was laid out by Alexander Mackenzie. They had two central areas that were used for recreation and particularly for sport, like football and cricket. Um, they had a gymnasium, and um, which is now in the near the place where the children playground was. Um, 
next to it, there was a toilet, apparently in 1905. It was only there for the ladies. I don't know if the men were used were meant to use the shrubbery around the bushes, maybe. Um, and trees and shrubberies surrounding open areas for the recreation and sport. Also, in the corners here, he had six formal parterre triangles uh, with formal flowers and planting. And they were growing those flowers in their greenhouses. Um, and from 1900, most of them were grown on site here. That's the shrubberies to screen the areas of the recreation and sport. And I, when looking at this picture, I'd like to, th to think that this gentleman here is probably enjoying a game of cricket and football here, which he can see through the vistas um, openings for the viewings. In the 1960s, most of the shrubberies were removed to help with maintenance. And now we just have paths and big open space for the recreation. Normally on this field here, they have sports as well. I think they have some children's football there, but the day I took the picture in, it was old people having a rest rather than playing football. They built a house for the head gardener. And in the 1970s, they built a new one. They replaced the original one with a new one here, which is still the home of the person in charge of the park here in Queen's Park. The original gymnasium had pole and rope climbing um, and climbing up an inclined plank. Um, we have a picture from Victoria Park gym about 1910. We don't know what exactly was in Queen's Park's gym, but we can assume that it was quite similar. And you can see that's the latest one. They only built it a couple of years ago um, in wood, so that it kind of re reminiscent of the original sort of wooden stru structures, which I think is very nice. Also, the drinking fountain. Um, when they started to build gymnasium and children and people who exercised, particularly children, liked playing there, they used to get quite thirsty. And there was a complaint in Kennington Park in Lambeth that children, having played in the gymnasium, would run outside the park and drink from the horse cab stands with the horses from their pails. And the powers to be didn't actually mind what the children were drinking from, from their own home, but they didn't want um, their park to be seen um, as a place where children nearby drink with the horses because they wanted it to be a genteel and well-behaved place. So they decided to build a water fountain. And luckily, the local philanthropist, Felix Slade, the one who founded the art, famous art school, he donated a fountain with a granite foundation and it had originally a metal um, bronze sculpture where the water came from and that was quite grand and big but the biggest one was in Victoria Park. Angela Burdett Coates, the famous philanthropist, paid six thousand pounds to create this enormously huge Moorish Gothic fountain, which is still there, and six thousand pounds in the time was well beyond even an average person's income. But they did provide very useful function, drinking water. Our Queen's Park fountain was not as grand as that, but it was still quite nice. And where it was is on the intersections of the two circles, right where the cafe is now, so I guess it would be somewhere there as is shown on the drawings. We don't know when it was installed or when it, was, when it disappeared, but this picture is dated roughly around 1910, so it definitely was there then. And also a bandstand was a regular feature of Victorian parks. Um, this one here, came in 1891 and it was designed by, produced by Mark, Mark Farlane and uh, Co of Glasgow, which was famous for making bandstands. Um, 
It was restored in 1992 and then grade two listed, and it was restored to its original Victorian colors, looking lovely and bright. That picture here, I showed it on my tour and someone said, there aren't any steps, where there are steps originally? And I found that picture to show that indeed they had the steps. So it was exactly as it was in the Victorian times. Um, the design, if you look at the design of any London bandstand um, in a London park, if you think about English architecture, it's not classic, classical, it's not Gothic. If, it, if anything, it is something oriental in design. And that's because that's exactly what it is. And there's a very interesting story how they came to be about. Captain Francis Falk of the Royal Engineers in 1855 visited an exhibition, Ottoman exhibition in Paris, where he saw an example of a sales kiosk popular in um, Turkey and other countries of the Ottoman Empire. And it looked very similar to this. It was basically a raised plant platform under a, canopy, under a canopy to sell things at a market and it was quite popular in the East. And when he was designing in 1860 two bandstands for the Royal Horticultural Society at South Kensington, um, he copied that design from the Ottoman Empire exhibition in Paris and created two bandstands and then when that showground was, um, when the Royal Horticultural Society ground, gardens were closed to make way for the Natural History Museum at South Kensington, in 1883, it was moved to Southwark Park and another one, the, the second one was moved someplace else. But the one in Southwark Park, this is a picture from last year, looks exactly like it did at the time. And that's where all the subsequent bandstands took their inspiration for the design from. We come to the time of the war and um, Willesden, like most places in London, was hit quite badly. And there were a few bombs um, dropped here, as you can see, but actually there were quite a few more than shown on this map. And it played its part in the history as well. Um, in the war, the southern field where the gym, gymnasium is was used for a barrage balloon and a shelter for the people who maintained it and who managed it. And the rest of the field was dug up for shelters. But when people tried to use the shelters, they realized that they were waterlogged uh, from the days of the Royal Agricultural Show. Um, this place is clay and it has five springs rising within the grounds, so they couldn't really use them and ended up doing their own shelters and their own homes after that. And the north field and the, the other space was dug up for the allotments. They also took down the railings from the bandstand and from the perimeter of the park to help the war effort. Uh, they had a bomb, doesn't show here, but there was one which fell and destroyed the paths at the north side of the park, where they later created the woodland walk area. Going back to the original features, in 1930 there was a refreshment building which was closer to the um, gymnasium, the playground originally, but later it was built next to, uh, to replace the tennis pavilion. The tennis courts are over there to the left of the picture. Um, in the 1960s, the building was built up to create the two stories. And behind it, also in the 1960s, um, a nine hole pitch and park course was made, um, adding to the sports facilities of the park. Um, one of the corners now is called Quiet Garden, and that was also originally the entrance to the park, but in 1936, the gate was built with seats and the entrance blocked off, probably because this area was designed to be a quiet place of contemplation and they didn't think people are walking uh, through it. 
can we unmute some more microphones, please? I think someone has come up with a microphone. It's Eva or Eva. Yeah, if we can, please. Thank you. Um, so in 1960s, when the quiet area was created, the um, and you can see here the crest of the corporation of the city of London and that's because the park started as, ma as managed by the corporation of the city of London and is managed by it to this day so it is being run by the city of London corporation. In the 1970s um, in the 60s, they already did away with most of the shrubbery, but then in the uh, 1970s, they lost 180 elms due to the Dutch elm disease. Now, the park has about 500 trees and they're very well looked after. And that's the quiet garden area, which is planted with flowers um, at the moment to echo the original planting scheme. They used to have six and now there's one left. And right to the entrance of the uh, quiet area is a sculpture called Angel's Wings by Fred Comis, who was a um, German sculptor who um, was taken, he was a um, Jewish artist working in Frankfurt and at the start of the First World War, he was um, enlisted in the army and ended up in a Siberian prisoner of war camp, spent several years there. He, he eventually managed to escape and return to Germany and started his sculpture practice there. But when Hitler came to power, Fred uh, realized that being, um, Fritz as his name was then, realized that being Jewish, he and his wife wouldn't have a good life there. So they immigra emigrated to England. He lived and worked in Kilburn and um, reminiscent of his experience during the prisoner of war camp during the First World War. He created prisoner of war sculptures, which, is now, which are now in Gladstone Park, installed there in 1969. And um, there was some controversy there when they were badly damaged, but then they were restored and now a big feature of Gladstone Park nearby. Um, and his angel wings arrived in Queen's Park in 2006. In, 1970, in the 1970s, Queen's Park Area Associ Residence Association was formed and they did a lot, they do a lot of activities like they run the Queen's Park Day and various events and things throughout the year. And in 1987, they produced a Centenary of the Park brochure, souvenir brochure, which is also a very good source of um, information about the park. Uh, the only place you can find it now is Brent Museum and Archives. They have a copy here to look at. And this is um, was the local history society and us with our regular display at Queen's Park Day. Um, unfortunately, the last two years were canceled, but next time they're there, Wilsdon Local History Society will come again with all our leaflets and publications. The Woodland Walk, which was on the place where the original path was destroyed, it's a lovely area and apparently they had to close it during the lockdown because so many people were walking in the park because they couldn't go anywhere else. Um, the park, park's authority decided that um, it's not very good for the wildlife, so many people, so they closed it for a little while, but it is now reopened. The second sculpture in the park is called Noah, and we have been walking around it and thinking it was a lady uh, with an owl. It's not. It's Noah with the animals from his ark. And it is by a French sculptor, Michael Manzoni, installed here in 2001. It's made of wood. Um, in the 1990s, on the place of the original um, gardening shed, they installed the Pet, little pets farm, pets corner, little farm where children can go and look at the animals and they have a lovely little display. It's quite small but very sweet, especially the goats. Um, I mentioned five springs rising within Queen's Park boundary and they installed some new drainage but didn't help much because in spring it still floods like that because there's clay and there are springs. 
uh, the whole area is a conservation area. So not only people cannot um, very easily change anything on the fronts of their houses, they have to apply for permission. It also applies to the trees. Trees with a certain diameter and uh, over 1.5 meter in height, uh, people have to ask planning permission to do anything with them. So the area is very well preserved. Um, we have two listed buildings in the park. One was the famous bandstand, and the second one is this little telephone kiosk. It is tucked away between, um, at the entrance of the park on Harvest Road, between Mortimer Road and Harvest Road. And um, it is so in such an obscure place that hardly anyone notices it or knows it. And although, um, and probably that was his saving grace because a lot of telephone kiosks were left all over London as a sort of important historical things, but they got vandalized and treated quite badly. This one is not. It's in a surprisingly good condition. It does smell a bit of a toilet if you go in um, without airing at first, but apparently I was told that this phone box still works if you put your coin in it. Um, local residents and the parks authorities are talking about doing something with it, probably something like uh, creating a community library like a lot of these places have been transferred into. So maybe one of those days this telephone kiosk will be more remembered and loved than it is now. Another listed building, although it is only locally listed, is the first synagogue in London in Chimning Road, just in the borders of the park. And now we can a very, do a very brief tour of the places around the park. I know that we're probably going to run out of time and won't have much time to talk about the streets around the park, but we'll just have a very quick visual look. And this was built in 1905 as the first synagogue in London. Um, the Jewish community at the time wasn't very big, but they built with a view to develop the community in the future because the building is actually quite big. And you can see that it still looks exactly like it is today. In the 1960s, it had a fire and was quite badly damaged. And in 1974, for it was sold to an Islam, a Muslim foundation, Al Koe Foundation, and it is now a mosque and a cultural center. And it is very well looked after outside and inside. They really care for the building, it's beautifully restored. It was built by a rich Jewish landowner who owned lots of land in the area called Solomon Barnett. And he donated a plot of land for the big project and he was the moving force behind it. He was quite a major landowner in the area and here is a list of roads, may not even be the complete one, there may be more roads that he originally owned and developed, um, all in the surrounding areas. His offices were along Salisbury Road and he named the streets after the estates um, the areas in uh, Devon, Cornwall, um, where his wife came from and his wife's family. So not after himself, but actually places that his wife liked. So I think that was very nice of him. Um, Edward Harvest, that's the Harvest Road over there. He was a rich merchant who lived at the turn of the 16th, 17th century, and he left his estate to the Brewer's Company for the annual income to be used to maintain the road from um, Edgware to Tyburn. He had a house in Edgware and he was traveling to London on that Edgware Road, Kilburn High Road, Watling Street. And he left a legacy to maintain that road. And when the local authorities later came into being, Brent came to be entitled to the share of that fund, which is still going today. And now if you go to Brand Council website uh, and search for the Edward Harvest Trust, you will see that it is a trust that gives grant for community projects in Westminster, Brent, Camden and Harrow. So it's still very much, his legacy is still very much there and doing good things. So. 
I had a lady who came on one of my tours and I was telling the story and she said, oh, my scout group got the, the money from this fund to go on a trip. So we remember Edward Harvest, not just for the name of the road, but also for the money that he left for things which are still going on. Um, another street, Reverend Kemp was prebendary of St. Paul's and that's the Kemp, Ro Kemp Road historic picture and how it looks today. By contrast, Thomas Kesslake was a local builder and that's the Kesslake Road. Another one was named after Henry Hart Millman, who was a historian, dramatist and professor of poetry at Oxford and the Dean of St. Paul's and he's buried in St. Paul's Cathedral. And another, Saint, and another ecclesiastical commission famous person was Crichton. Uh, Mandel Crichton was a Bishop of London. Um, he was interested in education and he assisted in the formation of Kilburn Grammar School. Uh, that was the small school based at St. Paul's Kilburn Square that was transformed into a bigger school and eventually became the first state secondary school in the borough of Wilsdon. I am not going through the history of the school now because I'm aware that I'm running out of time, but if you come on the walk, um, we talk in detail about the story of the school, which originally was the school for boys, and the girls school on the opposite side of the road, uh, which actually was there before and um, it was associated with Mariah Gray's training school, um, who trained women to become teachers. Um, Salisbury Road, on the other side of the park, people say, what's the funny spelling? And the spelling is because Salisbury is not named after the famous town in England, but about a family, a very a sort of famous family name of the local landowners. Um, there were a few Salisbury's, but it was um, Lady Sarah Salisbury, who was the widow of a judge of the High Admiralty Court, who bought the estates around Wilsdon, and she owned quite a lot of land, and her biggest place was Brondesbury House, uh, which was a big farm here, and this is where Queen's Park ended up eventually, and that would be Salisbury Road over here. Um, she got Humphrey Repton, the famous garden designer, landscape designer of the time, to redesign the gardens of her Brondesbury house. And when he did a drawing in his 1794 uh, little red book, as it was colloquially known, um, he presented, this was a view of how he, what, what would be the view of the park of the client after he has finished with it. So that's his vision. We don't actually know if it was indeed how the park looked or not, but it was him who called the place Brontesbury Park. So that's the name we have for the area today. On the corner here, that's the park. Um, at the end of the century, there was quite a hub for Wilsdon local board offices. There was a fire station, the library, the first public library to be opened in Wilsdon, and the police station. The new building was built in the 70s because the original one was um, bombed during the war. So that's the fire station, the library, and the police station further down there. And that's the, was the libraries which were open in the same year. The first one was Kilburn and Halston and Wilsdon Green. Quite a few famous people lived and live locally. For example, Richard Baker, who was a famous newsreader. He lived in Kingswood Avenue. Barbara Pym, um, a writer, she also lived locally. We'll quickly run through those. Paul Weller and the Jam filmed their video when you're young in, of 1979 in the park, in and around the park and also Kilburn High Road. And you can see that in the 70s, before the restoration of 1992, the bandstand was painted white. 
another famous video, and both of those are available on YouTube. Cliff Richard and the Young Ones, they did a charity single, which is very weird, but a lot of fun. Again, they have the bandstand and the scene in front of the toilets. There they are. There is an excellent resource, which is Northwest London Music Map, created by our famous local historian, Dink Wandling. Um, which is on the not just Camden Maps website, and it gives you just about every music person and music establishment in Brent, or in Wilsdon, it's Kilburn and Wilsdon. Um, very, very meticulously researched. So they have a few, there's only three who are not, who are fairly obscure, but still interesting that we know about them. And here are a few celebrities which you can see strolling in around the park at various times because they all live locally. So this is quite a popular area for people to live in. Um, so what we did, apart from the walks, um, we created trails which, uh, well, we call them um, trails for suitable for all ages. Originally, the idea was that they would be trails for children so that families can come and do something, do an activity together with their children. Um, but then we had lots of parents coming back to that and said, oh, we had so much fun actually. <laughs> A great idea for adults as well. So for all ages, they're available free. You can download the print them, or if you're interested in a printed copy, we have a few as well. They should be available to um, in the local libraries, depending on how quickly we can bring in a new supply, they go quite quickly. Um, there's one for um, Queen's Park, for Wilsdon, and one uh, for the Welsh Harp is coming soon. I have a list of um, sources and books to read and where the information comes from much more interesting stuff there. Uh, this will be available um, online as well, so people can use the references. Um, please join us at Wilsdon Local History Society. We have regular monthly meetings online and in person and local history tours. And we always also publish a journal twice a year uh, with information only on Wilsdon local history, all sorts of things. And um, the journals are available online. So if you live in America, you can get access to the journals and recordings of our talks and le lectures as well. But this project is, uh, we have a website for this project. It's called Brand Heritage. Um, it is sponsored by Brand Museum and Archives and Heritage Fund. And the, the way they um, assess the success of the program is by how many uh, feedback forms they get. So I will send everyone a link. Well, the Eventbrite will automatically send everyone a link uh, with a link to the feedback form. And we will be grateful if you can leave us some feedback because then if Brent Museum and Archives like the idea, they will let us do a few more walks all around uh, the borough of Brent and eventually we may even get to Wembley. Um, so that's the end of the presentation and now I'm going to stop the share of